nine in a row for the big red machine, your Cincinnati Reds. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, June 20th. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White. Today on the show, the return of Joey Votto. A bunch of pitchers got destroyed. Corbin Burns, uh, Team Name Tuesday, and much more. Before we get started, please like this video and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Let's jump in. Oh, my good goodness gracious. Oh, my goodness gracious, Scott. Cincinnati Reds have won nine in a row. And I, for some reason, I get weirdly excited about when bad teams turn turn around. I like watching it. I like watching the young players come up and succeed. Old players come up and succeed in his first game. I don't know. It's just like really exciting for me. I don't know if that happens for you at all. One bit. Uh, yeah, no, it's nice to see. It's exciting. You know, the Mariners a couple years ago, they were kind of that team. The Orioles last year were kind of that team, right? Yeah. I can't say I would have imagined. Well, I guess the Pirates have lost seven in a row now, but you know, the Brewers are in the mix there, but you know, it kind of feels like the Reds and, and Pirates of all teams are duking it out for the NL Central title and competing with call ups. You know, the Pirates obviously just promoted Henry Davis, their very high end prospect, the number one pick in the draft two years ago after the Reds had their slew of call ups that maybe wouldn't have happened if that division wasn't so up for grabs. Uh, but it is. The Reds are now in first place. The Pirates technically in third because the Brewers are in that mix too, like I said. But they're only three games back. And they're, they're very much still in the thick of it. Yes, it's indeed. Fun. What were you going to say? It's fun. And, and you know, the, 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 the only team in that division with a positive run differential is the Cubs. <laughs> are they in fourth place, I assume? They're in fourth place. The Cardinals are last. Oh. Cardinals are way last. <laughs> What a mess. Anyway, the two, you know, two of the names that uh, the teams that you just spoke about there will be players from uh, our Oh My Goodness Gracious segment here. I'll just start things off. I want to talk about Joey Votto, and I realize the most likely outcome is that a 39-year-old first baseman probably will not matter all that much. But there is a chance. He, ma he made his return. He went two for three with a walk, and obviously his first home run of the season. He had three batted balls of at least 102 miles per hour. And if you look at his rehab assignment, his most recent one, uh, when he started things back up, he played 12 games in June at AAA, was not very successful. He was batting 162. Uh, he was walking a lot. He had 12 walks, a 385 OBP. You know, last year, only hit 205. Seems like he might have been playing through some injury. But two years ago, this guy hit 36 home runs with a 938 OPS. It was a different environment, a juice ball, whatever you want to say. I'm not calling him a must add by any means, Scott, but I think mm -hmm. there's a chance that he has value here. Joey Votto, 11% rostered, and the Reds were tied for the fourth most run scored in June entering Monday. So if he's batting somewhere in the middle of that lineup, there's going to be opportunities, you know, maybe in a roto sized lineup as a corner infielder or something like that. I think there's a chance here. What do you think on Joey Votto? I mean, we can't rule out the possibility. I, I was most impressed by the fact that uh, he had three batted balls, 102 miles per hour or more. The, the home run itself was the 102. Then he had a 104 mile per hour line out, a nearly 109 mile per hour single. So I um, mean, he was he was squared up the ball for sure, and showed that he still can put a jolt in it. Even at 39 years of age, will he do it with any consistency? I doubt it. And, you know, if I'm being honest, if I'm, if I'm being raw and, uh, what's the word, transparent, I hope he doesn't. Yeah, ah. I said it. There are a lot of people celebrating that home run Joey Votto hit, tweeting out, Bad take. You know, tears streaming down their face as they celebrated his trip around the bases. Oh, it's so beautiful. Joey Votto. It is. But I was thinking about Christian, Incarna Christian Incarnacion Strand and what this means for him. 
Yeah, he could play in the outfield, Scott. He'll be all right. Uh, well, why isn't he playing in the outfield yet, Frank? Because he just started there, I think, what, last week on Thursday? Why isn't he playing DH? I mean, Spencer Steer was in the lineup today in the outfield, so there's there's room for Encarnacion Strand right now. I understand there's room for him right now, but if, you know, if Joey Votto proves to be integral to the lineup, that's one less opening. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why Encarnacion Strand isn't up yet. I I I do agree that if they really wanted him in the lineup, they could find a way. But um, you know, this complicates it a little bit. I don't like complications. That's fair. Uh, I know coming into the season, the Reds said that they wanted to play Tyler Stevenson a bunch at DH to keep him from catching as many games as he has in the past. So I think that's part of the reason they kind of want to leave that spot open for him. Um, and look, if we're being honest, Spencer Steer and Christian Encarnacion Strand in your outfield, it, you know, it's, it's probably going to hurt your defense, uh, for your pitching. Not that, <laughs> not that the pitching is great for the Cincinnati Reds anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that wouldn't, that won't help things. So they're going to need to outslug teams. They might have a better chance of doing that with, uh, CES in the lineup. Scott, uh, if you're looking for a corner infielder, obviously we just spoke about Joey Votto. Would you rather add him or Tristan Casas? Because... Casas is actually doing some interesting things right now, and I hadn't really noticed. He went two for five with his eighth home run of the season, and the homer in this game, 110.8 exit velocity, 419 feet, and in 39 games since the start of May, Tristan Casas is batting 264 with five homers, 92.6 mile per hour average exit velocity, and a 16% barrel rate. So it hasn't really translated to big production yet, but mm -hmm. he's walking a lot. And he's clearly squaring the ball up. Uh, what do you think about Casas versus Vado for a corner infielder? I mean, I've, I've been keeping an eye on Casas. I've, I, I didn't know the exit velocity since the start of May was quite that high. The fact that he has just five home runs during that stretch, that, uh, what, 39-game stretch, I think is kind of overshadowed how hard he's hit the ball. But the plate discipline is good, and and yeah, the batting average has been going up very slowly. I just don't think there's a lot of competition for Tristan Casas right now, so I don't see really any incentive to add him. But I'm keeping an eye on him. I think if I if you're forcing me to add one today, it's probably Votto because he's the one garnering all the attention right now. But I'm not that wild about adding either. Okay, and I think in your standard size points league lineup or even like a head-to-head -head categories uh, type format, you're, neither of these guys probably matter for you, but uh, just names to pay attention to. And, you know, if you if you do play in a deeper league and you need a corner infielder, again, Votto there and Tristan Casas. Oh, my goodness gracious for you, Scotty. Well, I already referred to him. It's Henry Davis of the Pirates. Again, the number one pick in the draft two years ago is a catcher, primarily. That's that's how he was drafted. That's what he mostly played in the minors. But his major league debut came in right field. And he looked pretty good. He, he got a hit, a double. It was a hard hit ball, which always gives it more credence. 160, uh, 106 miles per hour is how hard that double was hit. He also had a 105 mile per hour line out with an expected batting average of 750. So in my mind, he was really two for three with a walk rather than one for three with a walk. But either way, it was a nice debut for Henry Davis. What really made me say, oh my goodness gracious, though. Uh, again, he started in right field. And it sounds like that's where he's going to play most often. They are willing to hamper his his uh, development at catcher to get his bat in the lineup. That's how that's how invested the Pirates are in 2023, baby. They gotta they're they're gonna let Henry Davis play primarily outfield. Now he's gonna work at catcher like in side sessions, and maybe he'll get a start here and there. Hopefully he gets a, enough appearances at catcher that he'll still be eligible at the position next year. Uh, but Sounds like he's going to play a lot. Sounds like he's going to play more than the average catcher even. He's catcher eligible right now, if nothing else. Might as well enjoy it. I've moved him up to 11th in my rest of season catcher rankings. I moved him ahead of Tyler Stevenson, ahead of MJ Melendez, ahead of Cal Raleigh. And I think he could keep rising from there. We'll see if he really does play every day in right field. 
and uh, if he continues to produce like he did here on Monday. Mm -hmm. So I moved Davis up to 14th, not as aggressive yet, but if we see a couple of good games and the fact that he is going to play as much as he is, then I could see uh, making a similar move, getting Henry Davis inside the top 12, maybe even top 10 at the catcher position. And yeah, my mind started thinking about, you know, next year and dynasty leagues and having that catcher eligibility. And, you know, that's what I think made us even more excited about his value was that he was a catcher that can provide a positive impact offensively, right? It's, you know, right. there's only a finite amount of those. So, well, that, to me, that was what was pretty exciting about him, I guess, from a dynasty perspective. So I don't know that that's necessarily true because this is something I've written about more often over the last couple of years in my dynasty writings. And I noticed in a prospects report I wrote earlier, just earlier this year about Henry Davis, how um, he may not end up being the team's long-term solution at catcher, but that would actually be better for his dynasty value. If you ever do a dynasty draft, a prospects only draft for a dynasty league, you'll notice catchers slide way down the rankings. It's just even, even if, First of all, it, it's hard for them at, at that grueling position to live up to their potential offensively. And even if they do, a lot of times their uh, uh, at-bats are, are limited. And so that drives down their value. Even a really good hitter at the catcher position, it, it's rare that he's a hugely impactful fantasy player. And so if you have a bat that's as good as Henry Davis seems to be, 433 on base percentage in the minors this year, has easy power, all the scouting reports say. Uh, you'd probably rather see him move off catcher and become like a true everyday player in another position. It's just going to be a safer profile. And if he does live up to the full extent of his potential offensively, he's going to be a higher-end player overall. I could see both sides to it. I, I guess, selfishly, I was thinking about just having another catcher in the pool that gets at bats at other positions, whether it's DH yeah. or right field, whatever it might be, you know, something yeah. like a Dalton Varsho entering this season, right? He was a third or fourth round pick in a lot of, you know, Roto type drafts. And I could see Henry Davis right. eventually making an impact like that. It's just, I feel like yeah. value would be elevated if he, if he still had that catcher eligibility. And I guess there's at least a chance now that, you know, for years to come, maybe he won't. Whereas, yeah. you know, I don't think we really kind of considered that. Uh, it's a lot. So. That's probably the best of all worlds if he's an everyday player elsewhere, but still making enough appearances a catcher to retain eligibility there. And and maybe that'll still happen. But um, I, I don't think it's I don't think the sky is falling in dynasty leagues if it turns out Henry Davis is is an outfielder. All right. Oh, my goodness gracious. Shout out for Luis Arise, who went five for five again. You know, some guys, uh, you know, they'll have a couple of five hit games in their career. That was his third five-hit game of this month. I mean, what Luis Arise is doing, you know, from a batting average perspective, I know he doesn't provide much power or speed, really good in points leagues, um, but the batting average is back up to 400 on the season for Luis Arise, and it's he's been awesome. Great, you know, great trade, I think, I guess for both parties. We'll talk about Pablo Lopez. He's been very up and down this season, uh, but I think Luis Arise has provided exactly what the Miami Marlins were looking for. A bunch of pitchers got destroyed here on Monday. Where do we start? I guess all the way up at the top, Corbin Burns going up against that feisty Arizona Diamondbacks lineup allows seven runs over five innings pitched. Six of those coming in the first inning. They just jumped on him and it kind of snowballed from there. Uh, did not have the cutter working in this one where, you know, if Corbin Burns doesn't have his best pitch. You know, like most pitchers, probably not going to work out very well. Uh, gave up a lot of hard contact on that cutter in the start. And uh, it is his first time allowing more than three earned runs since May 22nd. So he's been pretty consistent recently. But, you know, Scott, it's just kind of another blemish on a season where, kind of like Sandy Alcantara, we were talking about him yesterday. It's June 20th, and Corbin Burns has an ERA near four. It's just obviously not what you drafted him for. I don't know what, you know, do you have any latest thoughts here on Corbin Burns following another disappointing start? Well, as you said, it was the first disappointing start in a while. He was on a really nice trend before then, a really nice trend with the velocity on the cutter ticking up. And it was basically back to where it was last year. It was 94.9 is what he averaged on the cutter in this one. 
uh, versus 95 last year. Granted, it wasn't playing very well for him in this start, as you pointed out. But I, I think the overall trend is encouraging. And I'm actually, I was actually prior to the podcast writing an article about bounce backs and just, uh, you know, players who've struggled most of the season and appear to have come around recently and how much I'm buying into it, basically. And Corbin Burns was among them. I decided to take him off after seeing the way the start was going because it's harder to make the case he's bouncing back. But like, no, le legitimately, um, I do think he is trending the right way. And I moved him back into my top five at starting pitcher rest of season. And though I removed him from the article based on this start, just because it's more than I want to have to explain uh, here on the podcast, I will explain that I do think he is fine. Okay. Two other pitchers that got hit hard on Monday that I'm not really worried about. Jose Barrios gave up five runs over four innings pitched. He still had 12 swinging strikes on a hundred pitches. Not like he gave up a ton of hard contact in this one. And it was Barrios's first start allowing more than three earned runs since May 1st. So has been very consistent over the past month and a half. And Hunter Brown was the other one. He's actually been a little bit more inconsistent. The overall season has been very impressive to do what Hunter Brown has done as a rookie. I get it, but this is now the fifth time that he's allowed four or more earned runs in a start this season. Uh, Hunter Brown gives up six runs over five and two thirds up against the New York Mets. He does give up a good amount of uh, hard contact here. Anything to see Scott, any, I guess, concern over Jose Barrios or Hunter Brown in these outings. No, I I'm, as you pointed out, I mean, Barrios had been very reliable. His previous 12 starts, he had a 227 ERA. That's basically the whole season. Just his first two starts of the season were bad. And then he had 12 starts where he put together a 227 ERA. So it's a, it's a rare misstep for him. And one where the whiff rate was still fine, 12%. Still 87.2 was the average exit velocity. That's fine. Don't see anything to worry about here for Jose Barrios. Brown has been inconsistent, and I don't really know what to what to chalk that up to, other than just growing pains, rookie year, all of that. Uh, his last start, he threw seven shutout innings, so that just goes to show you how up and down it's been. But he's he's an elite ground ball generator, which is not something I think we've talked about much. His ground ball rate is 56.3 percent or at least it was coming into this start that i imagine would put him in the top five in all of baseball and for being such an extreme ground ball guy he gets a lot of strikeouts nearly 10 per nine that's a good combination that's that fromber valdez combination i mean even a better strikeout not as good of a ground ball rate as fromber valdez i guess but an even better strikeout rate uh, logan webb's kind of in that category too brian bayo looks like he might be entering that category too that's why i'm so excited about him and and Hunter Brown's in it as well. So overall, I like the profile, and I think you just got to accept a few misses along the way. That 56.5% ground ball rate ranks sixth among qualified starting pitchers this season for Hunter Brown. Close you know, enough. I, I was just letting you know, Scott. It wasn't yeah. like, uh, me correcting you. It was just, yeah, he's sixth. Um, the one thing, if I'm just picking nits here with him that I've noticed is he does walk a decent amount of batters, 3.1 walks per nine, and uh, he does give up a lot of hard contact, 90 mile per hour average exit velocity on the season. So, you know, in certain starts where he's not missing as many bats, maybe those are the ones that can get away from him a little bit. But again, he's been really, really good for most of the season. Two other names that got hit hard, but I don't really think it matters much because... I just don't know that they are going to provide much fantasy value moving forward. Uh, Josiah Gray, six earned runs allowed over five innings pitched up against the Cardinals. And on the other side, Jack Flaherty, six and a third, 10 hits, six earned runs. We've talked about both of these pitchers quite a bit, Scott. It's mm -hmm. a lot of inconsistency. We're expecting regression to come for Josiah Gray. So uh, I don't know that there's much to see here with either one. Well, it hadn't come yet for Josiah Gray for what it's worth. And I, he was a two-star pitcher this week, so I'm sure a lot of people started him. I had him yeah. as one of the sleeper pitchers for this week, acknowledging that the other shoe is going to drop at some point. So I covered my bases there. But um, he didn't really fail in the way you would expect him to fail. He only issued one walk, right? Or zero walks. 
can't find the numbers here. One, one walk, walk in this one. Yeah. One walk in five innings, and walks have been an issue for him. And though he gave up a bunch of hits, 84.7 was the average exit velocity. So it wasn't getting hit hard. Uh, I, I think his move from primar- primarily a four-seamer to a sinker was a good one to help prevent the home runs. It's, he's been trending that way, and that's good. But I'd, I'd like to see him throw the slider and curveball more, working those breaking balls a bit more, because there's still good swing and miss pitches for him, and maybe he could be the best of all worlds if that happens. But until we see evidence of it happening, I think he's going to remain pretty fringy. Uh, Jack Flaherty also didn't struggle. After his last start, I said, what looks like the the remaining issue for Jack Flaherty is just throwing strikes. He threw enough strikes in this start. He threw 65% strikes, which is fine. But he got hit hard. And while uh, Corbin Burns' cutter didn't appear to be working for him today, Monday, Jack Flaherty's slider seemed to be the culprit. Zero whiffs on an 105 mile per hour average exit velocity on that one pitch and that's not going to work if that keeps happening so it's just something or other seems to go wrong for flaherty every time out it seems like yep. and I, I i retain some hope that'll change but not to the point that i'm like willing to put him in my lineup obviously and it seems like that might be correlated too right scott where if jack flaherty there's one of two ways that he could be bad. If he's not throwing strikes and he's walking too many batters, and if he does attack the zone, then he's getting hit hard. So it's like, again, it seems like those things are kind of correlated where he's either nibbling and he's walking guys or he's pounding the zone and he's getting hit hard. So Yeah, I mean, usually the slider's a pretty good swing and miss pitch for him, so the fact he got zero on it, I think. I, I mean, I get what you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just I just think that pitch was flat for him today or whatever. Last name on this list here, he didn't exactly get destroyed, but just another disappointing outing for Pablo Lopez. An uneven start. He had nine strikeouts, 16 swinging strikes. Obviously, you love to see those two things. He still gave up five runs, four of those earned, over five and two-thirds innings. I think he left at the time. There was only three runs allowed, and then um, the reliever allowed some of those runs in to score as well. So didn't exactly help Pablo Lopez here. (sighs) I don't everything I look at, Scott, the swinging strike rate, the underlying ERA estimators, everything mm-hmm. still really likes Pablo Lopez. The one thing that I continue to notice, his four seam fastball is bad. I almost wonder if it would be best for him to just get rid of it. Throw a sinker, mm-hmm. sweeper, change up, curveball, make that your pitch mix. His fastball got hit hard again in this start. It's you know allowing over a 500 slug percentage on the season. It seems to be when Pablo Lopez gets in trouble, it's because his fastball gets hit. Yeah. Still, you think that would be reflected more in the data. The fact that all the ER estimator, ERA estimators like him is pretty weird. So he has a 440 ERA now. That's compared to a 349 FIP, a 352 X FIP, and a 317 X ERA. That X ERA was actually entering this start. So it might not be exactly 317 anymore, but it's really good is the point. And uh, despite that, he keeps struggling. For his last 11 starts now, it's a 5.48 ERA for Pablo Lopez. It's um, bad. <laughs> that is bad. Yeah, that's bad. That's really bad. There's no way I around. Don't know. I don't know what to do about it. You know? I, I agree. I mean, he's been I, I don't feel like I don't feel confident enough calling him a buy low. I'd be more likely to do that than selling low, but. Uh, we we kind of went through this a little bit with him last year too. Mm-hmm. And so, look, it, if you are someone who likes to trust the process and the underlying numbers, then you should be buying on Pablo Lopez. But at the same time, I, I can't really blame you because this has been a pretty long stretch now where he's been very underwhelming for fantasy baseball purposes. Uh, before we hit the break, we have you know, look, the Reds are not the only team streaking right now. <laughs> the San Francisco Giants just Mike Yastrzemski just hit a three run walk off home run in the 10th inning and the giants have now won eight games in a row uh, coming off a sweep of the LA Dodgers. So good for them. It's interesting time uh, in baseball. Let's take our first break. When we return, we will hit some waiver wire hitters here on fantasy baseball today. Welcome 
welcome back and a quick reminder to sign up for our Fantasy Baseball Today newsletter. If you haven't already, cbsports.com slash newsletters. You click on the FBT logo, punch your email in, and that will get sent right to your inbox every day. It's free, uh, delivers a bunch of news, uh, items from the rundown, different statistical uh, anecdotes, all kinds of fun things. Uh, and again, it's free. If you're watching on YouTube, scan the QR code in the top right corner. That will take you right to the website to sign up for our FBT newsletter. Let's talk about some waiver wire hitters, Scott, here, and some uh, middle infielders, guys that have different kind of eligibility. Brendan Donovan, I brought him up recently, Scott. He said, eh, not really buying in yet. Need to see more. Uh, he went one for four with his seventh home run. In the month of June, he's betting 302, two homers, and 833 OPS. He's 63% rostered. The other name here is Geraldo Perdomo. I think I brought him up last week when you were not on the podcast. He went two for three with two walks and a run scored. He has now let off three straight for a lineup that has scored the fifth most runs in baseball this season. Uh, Perdomo is batting 300 with five homers, seven seals, and 882 OPS. The problem is that StatCast does not buy it one bit. They say he is like the worst hitter of all time. Uh, Scott, if you're speculating on one of these... I don't know, multi-eligibility uh, guys. Is it Brendan Donovan or Geraldo Perdomo? I think it's Donovan. I think it's Donovan. There is, uh, let's see, it's been a while since I've looked at Perdomo. But, hmm, I don't know. That's a close call. Because I, I, they're, they're actually pretty similar in terms of the offensive profile um you know perdomo five homers seven steals a 406 on base percentage he's actually done a better job getting on base than donovan this year when that was the main thing donovan was good at as a rookie uh so i don't know i mean i don't think either of them are especially high end and so we're talking about pretty deep leagues where you'd even look into them in the first place. Let's see. Okay, so this might be... Oh, never mind. Yeah. I I guess maybe I'm leaning slightly toward Perdomo now. Okay. But they're both pretty low end. All right. Should we do anything with Jaron Duran? He's quietly turned it back on. He went three for three with two RBI. And so far in June, he's betting 326 with six doubles, four steals, uh, no homers, so that's the problem there. He's kind of a batting average and speed specialist, I guess you could say. 885 OPS in the month. He's 34% rostered. Scott, do we do anything in Jaron Duran? Maybe re-add him if he was dropped in a five outfielder league. Well, I mean, it was a nice game. It was good to see. In fact, he batted leadoff. Uh, was kind of unexpected, I guess. But, you know who was out of the lineup for this one? Justin Turner. Justin Turner's been one of the most productive hitters in June. And so I don't think he's going to be out of the lineup that much. I don't know. Maybe this, maybe this cuts into Adam Duvall's playing time. Duvall's hasn't done a whole lot since returning from the IL. And so maybe he could start losing at bats to Duran, but I'm sorry, Duran, not Duran, Duran, somebody else. So maybe he could start losing at bats to Duran. But um, as of now, this was only Duran's fifth start in the Red Sox last 10 games. Yeah. Yeah, so it does kind of limit what Jaron Duran could do there. Uh, all right, so we'll pay attention to see if it goes anywhere. If, if there's an injury, you know, maybe Duran could step step in and uh, make more of the opportunity. But for now, it seems like <clears throat> might be a part-time player moving forward. In two-catcher leagues, a name that we brought up recently is Yiner Diaz. He went one for four with his sixth home run. It was his third homer in the past six games. He started seven of the past eight for the Astros. He's getting more opportunities at DH with Jordan Alvarez out. And so far in the month of June, Yaner Diaz batting 333 with four homers and a 1028 OPS, 10% rostered. I don't know. Do you think that would cover all two catcher leagues, Scott? 10%? Because no. if not, I, I think he probably should be rostered in all two catcher leagues. Yeah, probably. I mean, we have seen two pretty high profile catcher prospects. Henry Diaz, who we've talked about, and uh, <laughs> you said Henry Diaz, <laughs> Henry <laughs> Henry Davis, who we've talked about, and Bo Naylor, and 
I would take both of them over Alvarez. And meanwhile, let's see, Bo Naylor's at 29% and Henry Davis is at what's his rock? Uh Henry Davis, I think he's up to 48%. Okay. So that's he's probably rostering on two catcher leagues at this point. So yeah, I would definitely take both of them over Diaz. Diaz, you know, eventually Orton Alvarez is going to be back. That's probably a month away. So as a, as a short term play, Diaz is fine. But I don't see him taking over as the primary catcher. I just think Dusty Baker values defense too much at that position. It really seems to like uh, Martin Maldonado. But Diaz is a good hitter. I mean, two minor league stops. Last year, he hit 306 with 25 homers and 898 OPS. Makes contact at a good rate. And should be productive for as long as this lasts. So in two catcher leagues, I would say he's definitely worth rostering at this point. But again, I'd prioritize the two latest call-ups over him. Yep, and I agree with you as well. I was thinking, is there an opportunity for Diaz to get at bats even once Alvarez returns? It probably is going to be pretty tough. I mean, maybe if Alvarez is playing in the outfield, they could play Diaz at DH, but uh, Alvarez is going to be coming back from an oblique injury. I don't know how much they're going to want him to play in the outfield, so they're probably going to want to protect the asset there and will will mean bad things for Yainer Diaz's playing time. Three names in deeper formats. We talked about Kerry Carpenter and Mike Talkman uh, yesterday. Wanted to mention Michael Garcia, who went one for four with his second homer. He also had two steals over the weekend. He's batting 268 with two homers and seven steals in 39 games for the Royals. And typically you think of, all right, a middle infield type guy, doesn't hit the ball that hard. 92 mile per hour average exit velocity, a 51 and a half percent hard hit rate for Michael Garcia. He's mildly interesting. 7% rostered. Scott, what do you think of him? Yeah, mildly interesting, I guess. If if I'm calling if I'm calling though uh uh Perdomo and Brendan Donovan, if I'm calling them just low end options, then I mean Michael Garcia isn't nearly on their level so we're, we're talking about really deep leagues where you'd look into him primarily for the stolen bases and uh i don't play any too i don't play in too many leagues like that yeah probably would have to be a 15 teamer although i don't you know, know he, I, he might it's, already... it's a bad choice in a 15 teamer too it may be a desperation choice but i'm not going to get excited about picking him up yeah i <laughs> mean look i have 15 team leagues guy where i would welcome michael garcia on my team oh, really? i think I'm starting, uh, I have, in my main event league, I have three Marlins in my lineup. That's like two Marlins too many. You know, I've got Jorge Soler. He's been a godsend this season. But then I also have uh, Garrett Cooper and Joey Wendell in the lineup. It's it's okay. rough. It's rough out here, man. It's, yeah, it's Mike what, what place are you in? He's not available. Um, I think we're either in third or fourth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know I have teams lower in the standings who don't have those issues. So, yeah, it's interesting. Fourth place, uh, fourth place, 104.5 is the score there. Yeah, I was going to bring this up about how we really don't know much about pitching this year, and it's it's been very unpredictable. Uh, this team, I'll just quickly read off the pitchers I have. First place in ERA, first place in whip. Mm. Keep that in mind. Okay. Framber Valdez is the ace. Obviously, he's been amazing. Uh, Jesus Lazardo, he's been up and down. Kodai Senga, also up and down. Uh, Kyle Hendricks, Michael Waka, Kyle Gibson, Bryce Miller, uh, Julio Tehran, Ranger Suarez. That's the pitching staff. First in ERA, first in whip. I don't know. I don't... I don't think you're going to stay first. In <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> That's why I need the hitting first around. few pitchers you named, it's like, how are you first in whip? And then, okay, you have... You have these uh, kind of um, uh, out of nowhere successes who happen to have like crazy low whips right now that you can't imagine that would last. Like even Bryce Miller, what's his whip? Bryce Miller's whip has got to be below like 0 0.9, right? I think it's 0.88. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably not going to last. Just, I, just like law of averages. I know he doesn't walk anybody, yeah. but still, like he's got to give up more hits at some point to bring that whip up higher considering he doesn't miss many bats 
I oversold it a little bit. Second in ERA and third in whip. But the point remains, it's a 15 team oh, okay. league. And, you know, this, that pitching staff is top three in ERA and whip. It just yeah. doesn't seem like it would make sense. But this is like the bizarro pitching year in fantasy baseball. So there you go. Let's hit some news yep. and notes. Yordan Alvarez went through some stretching pregame Monday. It's not much, but it's the first bit of physical activity since he went down with a strained right oblique. Hunter Green was placed on the IL with right hip discomfort that he's been battling for a few weeks now. And it's unfortunate because obviously he's probably your SP3 or SP4 and gets a ton of strikeouts. So not ideal. Jazz Chisholm is expected to begin a rehab assignment this week. He's been out since mid-May with turf toe in his right foot or on his right foot. Is turf toe on your foot or in your foot? I think it's in your foot. It's not like a fungus. Yeah, I don't know. That, that That's a weird one. Let us know. Tim Anderson has missed two straight with right shoulder soreness. However, reports are good, and the hope is that he will avoid the IL. Alejandro Kirk, unfortunately, could not avoid the IL. Uh, he was placed on it with a left hand injury, which means Danny Jansen should see most of the reps at catcher moving forward. Francisco Alvarez was removed from Monday's game against the Astros after fouling a ball off his right hand. Uh, but initial x-rays came back negative, thankfully. The White Sox are hopeful Liam Hendricks can resume a throwing program within the next week or so. He's been given a cortisone shot and a PRP injection as he works his way back from right elbow inflammation. Alec Manoa is slated to throw another simulated game on Wednesday, assuming all goes well. The next time he faces hitters could be in a game setting at one of the Blue Jays' minor league affiliates. Lance Lynn was placed on the bereavement list and will miss anywhere between three and seven days. So there is a chance that he doesn't make his next start, which is supposed to be this weekend against the Red Sox, but we shall see. Kenta Maeda is likely to return to the Twins by the end of this week, and he's posted a 2.03 ERA over four starts at AAA and has been out since late April with a right tricep strain. If he does return, Scott, it's probably the end of uh, Louis Varlin, huh? Yep. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, mentioned this earlier that Henry Davis is likely going to be playing most of his games in right field. Moving forward, Anthony Rendon was placed on the IL with a left wrist contusion. Tanner Houck will be reevaluated later this week before a determination is made regarding whether he'll have surgery to address a fracture on the right side of his face. Graham Ashcraft is expected to rejoin the Reds rotation this weekend against the Braves. We had a bunch of Rockies updates. Ezekiel Tovar placed on the paternity list. Brendan Rogers slated to begin hitting drills this week. He had surgery to repair a torn labrum in his left shoulder back in spring training. There has been some positivity around him, so maybe we get Brendan Rogers later on in the season. Uh, Charlie Blackman believes he could be back sooner than the initial mid to late July return date. And Chris Bryant played catch, hit, and did some light running on Sunday. He's been on the IL since late May with a left heel bruise. Josh Rojas was optioned to AAA, and as a result, Alec Thomas was recalled by the D-backs and instantly hit a home run off of Corbin Burns. He went two for four in that game, and uh, I was reading about him recently, Scott. Apparently, Alec Thomas, he ditched a leg kick in his batting stance, and then he just kind of took off in the minors. He was batting 348 with three homers, two steals, in 26 games at AAA. Uh, do you have any interest in Alex Thomas? R really hitter friendly affiliate, AAA affiliate, as we've made reference to a few times with other players. And uh, look, um, Alec Thomas was a monster down there last year, too. And it didn't translate to the majors. I would say the biggest issue is where's he going to fit because they have. Let's see, Gurriel started at DH. Normally, Gurriel starts in left field, Carroll in center, McCarthy in right. Um, I guess if they're willing to abandon Pavin Smith, then maybe that opens up a spot for Alec Thomas, who's a, a plus defensively. He Adding him to the center field and, and putting Gurriel at DH improves their outfield defense. So I, I guess there is a chance there he could find playing time, but it might, it might take a while to sort that out, and obviously he'll need to perform. So it's more of a wait-and-see situation with Alec Thomas for me. So I brought up Kerry Carpenter and Mike Talkman as deeply outfielders. Would mm -hmm. you take Thomas over either of those? I mean, Carpenter's definitely my favorite of the three. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Talkman 
he gets on base a lot, but I'm not sure he does much else. He's been batting leadoff for the Cubs because of those good on base skills, but I'm not sure there's enough else there to get people excited outside of like a deep points league. So maybe I'd take a flyer on Thomas over him, but I, I consider Kerry Carpenter to be in a different class from those others, despite what the roster rate may show. Okay. Let's take our final break. And when we return, I have a potential sell high candidate. We'll do that right after this. Come and get it. So much new be this. Ah. When are you going to put those needles in? <laughs> Ow, my back. So much new butthead. Yeah, baby. Parenthood is cool. I now pronounce you husband and husband. This is the happiest day of my life. So many all new reasons. Hail, Infinite Earthling. <laughs> To stay on the couch. Let the games begin. An all new season of Beavis and Butthead now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Use promo code Nachos for one month free. Welcome back, and a big thanks to everyone watching us live. We do appreciate you being here. Make sure to hit that thumbs up, like this video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Sell high or don't even try, Scott. Michael Waka, another quality start. This one at the San Francisco Giants. Six innings, two runs, two walks, zero strikeouts for Michael Waka. Mm -hmm. Only three swinging strikes on 93 pitches. Eight hard hits allowed in this one. Has allowed two earned runs or fewer in nine straight starts. So even with your theory, Scott, that we don't know whether fantasy players, do they look at the overall numbers or the recent numbers? Whatever numbers they look at, Michael Waka has been really good, right, over the past two months or so. Um, what worries me here is two starts in a row now, his velocity has been down. And he's not some kind of big flamethrower. But it kind of makes me feel like it might matter even more for somebody like him because each of his fastball changeup curve all down 1.1 miles per hour in the start. His cutter was down 1.7 miles per hour. And again, that's two in a row. I don't know how much you can get from Michael Walker, Scott, but it's just something I wanted to throw out there into the universe where if you have him, maybe you try and chop him for like a top 30 outfielder or something like that. Just a, a viable hitter that you might need on your team. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, obviously it depends on what your pitching staff looks like. The, the reason why I think you might be able to get a nice return for Waka is because I mean, you, referred to it earlier just kind of the randomness at starting pitcher this year and the unpredictability well at the moment waka looks very predictable he's allowed two earned runs or fewer and usually it's much much fewer over his past eight starts so it'd be a pretty easy sell to someone who's really struggled with pitching but if you're that someone then it might be hard to part with them for uh you know, what's a top 30 outfielder like a Cody Bellinger just back from the IL or I, I don't know. I don't know specifically what you'd be talking about there. What about like a Eloy Jimenez trying to buy and hope he stays healthy? Catch lightning in a bottle or something. Uh, you'd have to have really good pitching, I think. Okay. I, and, and, and not many people like that's the thing. Like it's the scarce. It feels like the scarcest asset that you're shopping here. So. I feel like if you're going to sell Waka, and it doesn't seem like he can sustain this. I know he had like a 320-something ERA last year, which makes me a little hesitant to say, oh, he's just going to implode. Uh, but it doesn't seem like he can sustain this. But I th I think he might be able to do better than that. That's that's what I'd be aiming for if I shopped him. And, um, you know, go look for the team that is the most desperate for pitching that's still in it. You know, that's not the last place team. Cause they've, they, they may have already tuned out by now, but uh, the one most desperate for pitching that's still in the race and, and, you know, see what you can get. Okay. Make an offer, make an offer that seems like just a little bit too far and see if they take it. Okay. And work back from there. Thinking about, Dansby Swanson or Carlos Correa, but you probably want someone even better than that, huh, Scotty? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, like, I don't, yeah, I would want, I would try for even better than that. I mean, and, and obviously you can take your own needs into consideration. Not everybody needs a shortstop. And so yeah. why would you even look for them? But, uh, but yeah, I think, I, I think you can do better than that. 
because I mean, the whole idea behind sell high is that people should be eager to acquire this guy. And I think maybe we are at a point now with Waka where they are, especially given the the pitching market right now. So your offer should reflect that. And there will be regression. I mean, there's, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, breaking news here, but he's got a 2.90 ERA after the start. And Michael Waka has a 378 FIP, a 457 X FIP. So he has had some home run luck this season. BABIP is a little bit low. Train rate is high. So I think some of those things will normalize as a season continues on here. And uh, again, don't just sell for the sake of it. But if you could turn Michael Waka into a good asset, something I would look into doing. What is going on with these hitters this season? We'll start off with two New York Mets. Francisco Lindor went two for five with his 14th home run. The problem is that he's batting 216. Uh, the counting stats are there, Scott. Seven steals, eh, maybe a little bit underwhelming for Francisco Lindor. But, you know, the power has been okay. Uh, yeah, but 216 batting average is a killer. The other one here is Starling Marte, who I know you had as a bus coming into the season. And, you know, the batting average has been all right. It's been middling. It's given you a lot of steals. Uh, but he's the opposite of Lindor. His counting stats are terrible. He's, I think he's only got three home runs on the season, too. So... Yeah, it's it's been a disappointing go here for uh, for Marte and uh, Lindor's batting average. Uh, what's going on? You think it gets better for these two? Had Lindor as a bust last year, I think, but maybe it was a year early, early on that. No, I mean, I think uh, I think Lindor's probably going to come out of it. Uh, let's see, looking at the underlying numbers here. No, they're not like the expected stats aren't so far off from last year. The expected slugs actually better. The batting average about 16 points low, but the exit velocity seemed fine. He's striking out a little more, but not so much more that you think there's been a real diminishment, real reduction in skill here. Like that would be a great target with Waka if you want to try that. Lindor, especially like if you include your scrubby shortstop <laughs> with them. Or if the guy who has Lindor is already kind of, you know, staked out a replacement, you, you gotta you, with trades you gotta take into account the other team's context as much as anything, I think, and that's why it's hard to pull trade offers out of the blue. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I would most I, I would say that Lindor I expect to be better and probably much better than he's been so far. Marte less so, as you pointed out, I had him as a preseason bust. And I just think um, he's at an age where decline makes sense. He is much slower now. So like just, just in terms of how fast he runs, we can see that he's lost something physically. Uh, and it's very likely he gets hurt at some point in the near future because he always does. Stalling Marte has almost as many steals as he does RBI. It's just, it seems weird for a player of his caliber. You know, it's 20 RBI, 19 steals on the season. So, mm -hmm. and yeah. since he does have that steals, and I mentioned how he's gotten slower, I, I'm looking at his percentile rank for sprint speed. It's 47th percentile. Last year it was 68th. Every year before then it was 83rd or higher. So, like, his speed is on in precipitous decline here. It has an impact at his ability to steal bases, which is great. But, like, he doesn't run nearly as fast anymore. He's he's slower than the average player now. Yeah. I, I have to imagine the power gets a little bit better. His home run to fly ball rate is 5% this season for Marte. And he's actually hitting the ball harder this year than he did last year. So he's not someone that typically hits for a lot of power. And I, I, I wouldn't expect that. But, you know, maybe he can get to, I don't know, double digit home runs by the end of the season or something. It's just, yeah, three I mean, that's fair really for him. That's fair. I just I don't know that the return is going to be enough to justify the weight. Like I don't see Starling Marte. Starling Marte is probably going to be better than he's been for at least for however long he's healthy. But I don't know that he's going to be so good that it's like a priority on the trade market to go out and get him. Okay, some leftovers. We'll start with the pitchers here. Studly performances from Max Scherzer, who. Pitched eight innings of one run ball with eight strikeouts and 15 swinging strikes at the Astros. James Paxson makes it three straight quality starts. 
16 plus winging strikes in each of his past four outings. He just looks like stud James Paxton once again. Please, please stay healthy wow. like for as long as possible. And uh, Merrill Kelly, a great start at the Brewers. Seven innings, one run, seven strikeouts with 13 swinging strikes and just quietly having a career season for uh, Merrill Kelly. Anything to add on those three, Scott? Kelly, Paxton, and Scherzer. No, not really. I noticed Scherzer threw a lot more sliders in this one. His previous two starts were pretty awful. Combined 11 earned runs on 18 hits and two short starts. Uh, but bounced back nicely. 34% sliders. Normally it's 18%. Hasn't been the most effective pitch for him this year, but... Uh, you know, he's he's tinkering. I think he's going to figure it out, and particularly in this pitching market, going to be a pretty good asset for you still, even with the ups and downs. But yeah, Merrill Kelly's been very consistent. And uh, who was the other one? James Paxton. Paxton, oh yeah. Big Maple, baby. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been on the, the Paxton bandwagon basically since his first start back, and it hasn't. The ride hasn't slowed down yet. I think we're just going to take it all the way. The only thing I noticed with Paxton that I wanted to mention was that his fastball velocity was down 0 0.8 miles per hour. So let's see where it goes from here. Uh, but for the most part, that fastball velocity has remained all season long. I mean, there's probably a justification to sell high with him too, just given the injury history and particularly at his age, the likelihood of something coming up. I'm not nearly as motivated to do that as with Waka. But, you know, if you're stacked with pitching and you can find someone who isn't, then maybe you could really get a huge return for Paxton. It's something to think about. But for the most part, I'm just going to ride this out. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I guess in my mind, and I don't know why it would work this way, but I just can't imagine getting a lot for Paxton. I just feel like yeah. anyone who plays fantasy, they know that he's been so injured over the past couple of years. But at the same time, Michael Waka, you know, doesn't have an extensive well, track record. He was good last year, but, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I... The average pl fantasy player probably sees things differently than you or me or people who listen to this podcast. I, I don't think the average fantasy player listens to this podcast. I think the average fantasy player just logs in and, you know, messes around and doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really do that much research. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that's my that's my impression of the average fantasy player is a lo much lower comp level of competition than we're used to. Um, so that's why I think it might be worth looking into, but yeah, if I tried shopping Paxton and I, I don't think it's worth bothering to shop Paxton in one of my leagues, because I agree that the kind of people we play against would not overpay for him the way I'm hoping. One okay performance. I wanted to mention Andrew Heaney at the White Sox, five and two thirds, two runs allowed, six strikeouts with 14 swinging strikes. We haven't talked about Heaney in a while, Scott. There hasn't really been much reason to. I mean, he's kind of middling. Over a strikeout per inning is impressive, but the ERA and the whip are haven't been great. And, you know, the walks and home runs are, are an issue for him as well. So I, I think he's more of a streamer at this point than anything. We're talking about Heaney? Yep. Yeah, he's gotten crushed in June. His average exit, exit velocity for these four starts in June is like 94. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's led to, uh, I, I mean, obviously the results in this start were fine, despite that 96 average exit velocity, mile per hour average exit velocity in this start. But in those four June starts, he has a 467 ERA, a 173 whip. He appears to be a pitcher on the decline, not one we should rely on for much longer, if at all. Okay. What do we make of these two pitchers? Reese Olsen kind of turned in a quality start, six innings. Four runs, only three were earned. So I think technically it was a quality start. Was but, he on the streaming pitchers list for Monday? I I could go back and look. I'm not sure. I, I don't think like he should have been. Probably should have been. Um, you know, those 
those weekend recaps, <laughs> they, get, they get a little crazy, Scott. No, uh, I, I hear you. Uh, 15 swinging strikes. So, it, look, it's pretty impressive. I, like, there was one start where Reese Olsen got crushed, uh, but I think the other three have been pretty interesting for him. And the other name yeah. is Osvaldo Beto with the Pirates. Uh, turned in his first quality start of his career. Six innings, three runs, seven strikeouts with 11 swinging strikes. Uh, anything with these two, Scott. Reese Olsen, Osvaldo Beto. I like Olsen a lot more than Vito. Uh, Vito, or sorry, Beto. I thought Osvaldo you were making, Beto. I thought you were making a Sopranos reference, Scott. Hey! <laughs> By the way, so the Pirates rotation right now has an Osvaldo, an Oviedo, and an Ortiz. Like back to back to back. Three pitchers whose first or last name starts with O. I was wondering how common that is. The Braves lineup has Olsen, Ozzy, and Orlando. But that's the lineup, not the pitching staff. I don't know, just a lot of a lot of O names going around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's neither here nor there, but it's something I noticed. Anyway, Reese Olsen. Uh yeah, I like what I've seen from him. A lot of swinging strikes, really good secondary stuff. He's got that slider with the 3000 RPM and yet the changeup is actually his best swing in this pitch. He threw it more in this start against the Royals and got a lot of swinging strikes. Did allow a lot of hard contact. And uh that's probably why he allowed four runs, three earned, two home runs. But there's some there's some interesting things going on there and wouldn't surprise me if he emerges as an asset down the stretch. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at yesterday's rundown, Scott. Reese Olsen was on the list. And now that I'm thinking about it, we did recommend him and Josiah Gray. So, no, oh, okay. I must have yeah. just <laughs> dosed <laughs> through that as I usually do. Not really the greatest recommendations, I guess you could say. Uh, you're on Monday. Some hitting leftovers. Jordan Walker went two for four, now has a 12 game hitting streak. Looks completely locked in. Love to see it. Tommy Edmond with a bounce back game, two for two with two walks, a triple and three runs scored. I noticed that I was playing you in the podcast listeners league and uh, I had Tommy Edmond on the bench. So I didn't really feel great about that. Uh, <laughs> good job, Frank. Bobby Wood Jr. went two for three. Are, are we first and second in that league? Uh, we, I think you're first place for sure. And if I'm, I don't know, if I'm not second, I think I have the second most points scored. It's close. Uh, that's what it was. Uh, yeah, so there is a team that's seven and four. I'm uh, tied for third at six and five. There you go. And uh, yeah, I'm still second in points. Uh, you have a pretty he hefty lead. 3,419 points for you. 3,210 for me. So, yeah. I just like wanted to talk about how I'm in first place in the podcast listeners league. There you go. Eight and three. Get back. Done. Well, uh, got ourselves a pretty I'm looking at our matchup now you had Paxson go I had Merrill Kelly and Max Scherzer this is going to be a, a juggernaut of a week it's <laughs> two pretty good teams there uh Bobby Wood Jr two for three with a sock and a shoe his 12th homer and his 22nd steal the batting average has been so lackluster but uh Bobby Witt is still on pace for like a 25 45 pace which is very good for fantasy uh Jorge Soler went one for four with his 21st home run batting 260 with a 923 OPS Elias Diaz went two for five with a mammoth home run his eighth of the season 428 feet Luis Robert went two for three with his 18th homer Josh Young went three for five with his 15th homer uh five hard hits in that game and I wanted to bring up the strikeout rate Scott because I know you and I recently got into it about the strikeout rate it mm -hmm. is down to 25 percent on the season because it's only 14% in June. Josh yeah. Young has like taken off this month. Well, well, that was the caveat I allowed. If if the strikeout rate, if you can get it well below the 30% mark and 25% would be a completely different class of strikeout rate, uh, then I think what he's doing is more believable. His expected batting average with that strikeout rate now dropping to 25% for the year is... 272 which is pretty good for an expected batting average obviously he's batting his actual batting average is what like 290 um, i don't have it pulled up right now so he may not be able to sustain 290 yeah but you know i have a lot more hope for him hitting better than 250 than i did a couple weeks ago when we got into it 
He is at 284. So there you go. Pretty close to the expected numbers. And yep. I know Chris made a uh, like a poor man's Austin Riley comp. I think I think that might be fair. Uh, you know, it's it's still early in his career, and I guess you know in his season in this season. But you know, if he can get to thirty homers and hundred RBI and a two seventy five batting average, that's yeah, pretty much an Austin Riley. I mean, it's so. it's probably more like Nolan Arenado. I would say, like Josh Young doesn't hit the ball with those extreme exit velocities. Uh, Riley does, and Riley came closer to forty home runs than thirty last year. But you know, Nolan Arenado's pretty good, uh, pretty good player to aim for too. Uh, a couple others here. Corbin Carroll went one for four with his sixteenth home run, and I mean, you want to hear the June numbers? Three forty three batting average, seven homers, three steals, a twelve nineteen OPS. Uh, I. Someone told me that Corbin Carroll now has the highest OPS in the National League, which <laughs> sounds crazy and believable. He's been mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, Juan Soto ha- went two for four with a double dong, both homers to the opposite field. Now up to 13 home runs for him. Call to the bullpen. A few updates here. Jordan Hicks has a save three days in a row with Giovanni Gallegos working in the eighth inning in back-to-back games. Hicks averaged 101.9 miles per hour on his sinker. He hit a max of 104 on the pitch, and he's only 22% rostered. We'll see what happens with Ryan Helsley. I can't say this for sure, Scott, but I, I, I'm getting a sense here. I have a feeling, intuition, that Jordan Hicks is going to take this job and run with it for the rest of the season. Hmm. That's the feeling I'm getting. We've seen him do it before. I mean, it's it's not like Ryan Helsley was consistently getting save chances. They seemed to like him for higher leverage situations earlier in the game, and that's why Gallegos' save total was about even at the time Helsley went down. And we still don't really know what Helsley's, Helsley's prognosis is. It sounds like a short-term injury, but they've been doing a lot of testing and whatnot. So, yeah, I guess it's possible. And maybe he'll step up in that role. You know, he throws very hard. He's always thrown very hard. He's he's had success in the role in the past, followed by injuries. And his ERA and whip this year are not very good. But he's gotten the job done three days in a row. So they want to be crazy. Somebody asked me on Twitter earlier today, uh, Jordan Hicks or Adbert Alzali rest of season. And I said Alzali because... You know, I'm I'm still thinking in terms of Helsley coming back and Hicks going back to his old role when that happens. But I would say between the two, Hicks has more upside because of the scenario you laid out. Yeah, I think if you want to shoot for the stars, there it's it would be Jordan Hicks. It's you know the Cubs have kind of mixed and match. I know Alzali has has gotten the past couple of saves, but um, yeah, look, the Cardinals should be the better team too. It's they clearly haven't been, but that's yeah, that's a pretty close question for the Tigers. Some idiot on the podcast yesterday said that uh, Jason Foley should get the next save for the Tigers. Um, I don't know who that was. But Alex Lang got the ninth inning in this game, retired all three batters he faced for his 11th save. Uh, I should have factored in Jason Foley through 27 or 28 pitches yesterday, so probably was not going to work today regardless. For the Reds, Alexis Diaz gave up two hits uh, with a one-run lead, but he buckled down for his 19th save. For the Rangers, Will Smith allowed two base runners but picked up his 13th save. And for the Padres, Josh Hader was unavailable and everybody else was a mess. That's all you need to know, that the Padres wound up losing the game. Uh, to stream or not to stream, Scotty, on Tuesday, who did we say yesterday? Uh, I think it was, what, Ben Lively versus the Rockies in Cincinnati? Yeah. You and Chris liked that a little more than I did, but um, but it's I okay. Think, I think you said Oviedo versus the Cubs. Yeah, yeah, I'd prefer him to Lively. I think. I think Savali versus the A's is okay. I'm not opposed to rolling the dice on Ranger Suarez against the Braves. I did have him as the top sleeper <laughs> pitcher for this week, I, mostly I, because he had the two starts. When you're thinking in terms of weekly rather than daily, but. He's looked good lately. 
He really has. I just, I can't do it, man. <laughs> yeah, the know, Braves they're... against lefties, they have a 903 OPS as a team. It, the next closest is at 840. That's mm -hmm. crazy. They are so good against lefties. It's, that's that's I, a I, good point. I had Ranger Suarez as a, as a two-start option in my main event league. I benched him. I didn't even start him. I was like, I'm yeah. going to protect the ratios. I'm, I'm not doing it. Like, yeah, it's, it's scary. So, uh, maybe it gets the Mets later in the week, but I don't know, man, it gets the Braves. It's, it's pretty scary. Okay. Uh, you talked me out of it on Wednesday, Julio Tehran. It's a similar thing. Like he's pitched really well, but the diamondbacks are on fire right now. I, I just, I don't think that I could go there. Uh, AJ Smith Chauver at the Phillies that I think is all right. Pretty interesting. Garrett mm -hmm. Whitlock at the twins is really good. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would. I had Whitlock and Smith Shaver on the sleeper pitchers for this week as well, even though they were just one start options. I had Whitlock ahead of Smith Shaver, and so I'll stick with that here. And then I would agree that Tehran's the third choice. No, he's not. Hendricks is the third choice at Pittsburgh. Yeah, I was going to say Hendricks at Pittsburgh, and I think Blackburn at the Guardians is fine, but yeah, he would be fourth on the list if. The, I guess if those other three are gone, the Diamondbacks might end to Ron's run of success. So I'd, yeah, I'd rather steer clear of that one. By the way, Carroll is leading. At least he entered the day Monday, leading the NL in OPS ahead of Ronald Acuna, ahead of Freddie Freeman. <laughs> crazy, uh, crazy. You know who's fourth behind those three? Carroll Acuna and Freeman NL OPS, and he's only added to it here on Monday. Uh, fourth in OPS in the NL. Fourth. Luis Arise. Wow. An OPS. <laughs> Man, it's John Murphy fifth, Jorge Soler sixth. So the Marlins have two of the top six. That's crazy. Good for them. I, I think they're like 11 games over 500 now. It's again, it's fun. I, I like seeing these teams that didn't have many expectations turn their, I guess, seasons around or, or have good seasons in general. Let's wrap up with team name Tuesday. These are from Bob Weemers Woba. Or I think it's supposed to be Weemers Waba, but they don't fall down. It's some old commercial. Do you know it's got Weebles I'm, Wobble? I'm familiar. I'm not familiar with the commercial, but I'm familiar with it being referenced in pop culture. Yes. Okay. Acuna Moncada. That That's a, a classic there. Acuna Moncada, yeah. Yeah. Yep. From Terry, no Moa Tears. It's like the song No More Tears by Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, he also had a great poster with like Alec Manoa's face on Ozzy Osbourne's body. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. From KC, in honor of Scott freaking out about Colton Kowser and Aaron Hicks. Move, Hicks. Get out the way. Is it move or is it whoa? I always thought it was whoa. <laughs> uh, no, it's definitely move. Okay. And it's not Hicks. <laughs> no, it's he, not. I think you knew that from Matt Logan's runs allowed. Okay. Uh, Heim Old maintenance. Movie. Heim maintenance. I think this is something to do with cars. Heim joint. Oh, okay. When I looked it up. I, All right. I, I can't tell you. I just got a car. My first car last year. I, I can't really tell you much about cars. <laughs> uh, pour some Seeger on me. Sure. Uh, Geo sells Urshela's by the seashore. <laughs> All right. That's pretty good. Uh, and this is, I guess, some kind of coincidence, but Matt also had the same one. <laughs> Move, Hicks, get out the way, specifically yeah. for you, Scott. So there you go. Okay. From Felix, Eggs, Ober, Izzy, Alcantara. <laughs> A lot going on there. What's What's the Alcantara part? I don't know. I just eat scrambled eggs. Because I'm boring. Yeah, I like scrambled too. Yeah, let's go, Scott. Uh, from Michael, could have been Bader. Is, is that like just could have been better? <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. Okay. From Russ, I'll be there for you. Oof. <laughs> yep. No, that's fine. I just, your rendition was... All right, Scott, well, you could sing. No. You want to sing the next one? From it's a Mike. little hard because they're harmonizing so much. You know, it's hard to like kind of pick out the melody from those. Yeah. So I, I sympathize. Somebody's got to do it. Uh, Don't go chafing waterfalls. Uh-huh. 
from the machine at the Copa Copacabana. <laughs> that works. It's pretty good. Uh, from Ben, who I, I believe he said he's been a fan since 09. That's uh, I was back in high school, so long time fan. Uh, once mm. upon a midnight Drury. Hmm. I like that. That works. From, from David Wacamole. Uh, sure. And Darth Bader. All right. Yep. From Neil, Iquan from a land down younger. Uh, you had to sing it for me to get it. That's good. Uh, Galloway Guriel. Ed Sheeran. I I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Okay. Probably need Chris here for that one. Uh, (laughs) This is good. Because I'm just in teenage dirtbag by B. Okay. Uh, When we were young. Young with the J, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why quant we be Fred's? Why is why are you sticking Fred in there? I don't. I, there's. I don't know. How many okay. Freds do you have in baseball nowadays? I don't know. Maybe as Freddie Freeman. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Chevrolet Camonero Cruz Silvarinado. All right. Nestor that sounds B. like like that. That seems like a teeth uh, teeth. That seems like a Heath team name construct. Yeah, Chevrolet Camonero Cruz Silvarinado. There's a lot going on there. Uh, yeah. Nestor B. Pearson. Mm, don't get that one. I didn't know what it was, and I I tried to I tried to research. Some of these require so much research, and I, it takes a lot of my time actually. Uh, last one here. Why bay the cowser? When you her get the milk for Freeman. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a funny use of the expression, even if it's cramming way too many names into it. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. We went way too long, but we had to do it for the team names. For Scott, I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.